Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show of Task Force Geek Wednesday edition. I am your host tonight, the Spicy King, Scott Prime. We're going to talk about some comic subjects and convention subjects and some news around the industry. And we'll have all that right next. Welcome, everybody. Scott Prime here. And today I'm joined by... The lovely Jen Prime. Hello. Hello, Jennifer. How you doing? Doing well. Making another appearance on the show is G Dub, my buddy Gary Brown. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And then we got artist veteran Mike Kennedy. How you doing, my man? I can't hear Mike. Well, <laughs> has his mic turned on? Mike needs his mic turned on. <laughs> we can't hear you. Maybe I need to do something here. Let me see if I can. You've got him muted. I got him muted? Okay. Mm -hmm. It says he has himself, un he needs to unmute himself if he can. <laughs> well, I can't hear you, Mike. Still not. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting technical difficulties right now. It tested out fine, and now we can't hear Mike. Mike, I'm going to let you, I'm going to take you off here. I'm going to let you go out and come back in, and we'll give it another shot here in a second. All right. Off to, a <laughs> <laughs> Off to a wonderful start. So uh, let's talk about our first subject. Here we go. Let me see if I can find the little cool little blurb here. And I really want Mike here for this. So we're going to go to our second topic first. We'll be right back. All right, our first topic is James Tinian quits DC Comics for Subsec. Mike, can you hear us? He can hear us, but we can't still hear you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my. All right, James Tinian quits DC Comics for Substack. Does any I know Jennifer and Gary, you guys read what is it, the Nice House in the Lake and some various other James Tinian comics? Is that something is kill, killing the children? Is that one yeah, as well? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What are y'all thoughts about this? Do you care? What's your, just give me your perspective. Cause I, I know he's a great writer. I just don't buy comics based on whether he's writing something or not. So I'm going to you guys since you love some of his work. Well, I know you're happy. <laughs> well, he's off Batman. I mean, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I actually just finished reading um, nice house on the lake. Number three, about an hour before the show. Um, I really like that book that he's written. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't really care if he writes for DC or not. Um, my bigger issue is where he's going and kind of what that means for comic books um, in general, to be honest with you. Are you talking about Substack itself? Right. Yeah. Do you want to explain to people kind of what it is real briefly? Oh, I, my understanding of Substack is that it's an online comics creator. Um, I mean, so... Um, he wants to publish his own books online without DC looking over his shoulder and telling him what to write. And I can't blame him for that. Um, he's a pretty ho high profile writer for DC though. So his loss, uh, I mean, really, if you look at the books, it's him and Tom King are doing a ton of writing for DC across a lot of their books. And um, his loss is certainly going to be felt by uh, the company. So um, I really wish Mike were in here to, that he could comment on this, but I will tell you, as someone who has come back to comic books in a pretty strong way over the last year, I used to read all my comics on Comixology, and I have to tell you that while that medium is fantastic and um, so easy, I can get a comic book at any time, nothing replaces actually having a comic book in your hand um, and reading it and having it tangible for you to, to collect it. So much of comic books for me is actually collecting, treasure hunting, finding those hard-to-find comic books, uh, those treasures. So... Um, hey, it sounds like we got Mike. Am I back? Yes. You're back. Hey. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'll talk to you guys um, more about this Tinian deal. Jennifer, you have an opinion on this? Uh, I just hope he keeps writing the few comics of his that I really like and not put them only online. Because like Gary, I prefer to actually hold a book. 
I mean, that's just what I like to do. I like I'm, to feel and turning them. I'm old school like that. Uh, do we know anybody who just likes to read digital comics? I mean, like a younger kid or anything? No. That's yeah. what I don't. I don't know what they're reaching it's, to. I don't know if maybe like in another country, like well, in China or something, that everybody's downloading comics because I think yeah, I think. The, I asked the comic uh, store owner, Brian Alcorn of Wizards, about this, and he said, I'm not worried about it at all because everything they're going to produce, they're going to publish eventually because people want to collect things. And if anything, all this 2020 has shown us everything, like baseball cards, football cards, hockey cards, all have made a comeback because people are starting to get into just collecting stuff again. So Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it, and you're right about other countries – uh, Korea is the largest uh, digital consumer of comics. Okay. Uh, there are several online platforms that were started in Korea before they even brought them out mainstream to the United States and Europe and so forth. So I kind of understand where Tinian's going. Un un unlike you, Scott, I actually enjoy his Batman books. You okay. know, it's very almost, it has, it has a very nice feel from the old stuff from like Denny O'Neill and Steve Englehart. You know, there's there's more than just Batman opening a vial and answering the bat signal and kicking someone's butt at the end of the book. Uh, I hate that ghost so, character but, that's but in it that could, book But it could have been, but it could have been anybody. It didn't have to be Tinian. He's just the he's just the main flavor right now for that that subset of comics. Well, so, I heard and I other enjoy, and I enjoy his stuff. I think it's really well done. You know, there's a lot of. There's a lot of plot and thought, and if you look at that, and, and you mentioned Tom King, same thing as well. So you know and them, and if you look at the the fine print on doing it digitally, it's costing you as much, if not a little bit more, to go through Substack. And Substack is actually it's a a grant funded project. So it's these guys are not starting out having to go out and uh, collect investors or get people to back them up. It's not like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo. They essentially got the money to set this system up. Okay. My well, I, I know like creators like Jonathan Hickman is supposed to sign with them. Uh, just announced, I think maybe today or yesterday, Scotty Young, who's the writer on Strange Academy, Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going over there. And I mean, he's not leaving Strange Academy behind, but he's going to go over there and create some of his own stuff there too. So they got some big names. Um, I just know I won't be one of those guys that pays, you know, $75 a year or whatever to subscribe to, to all this stuff. In my opinion, this is just my opinion. I feel like comic books in general, everybody wants to write the next movie franchise. And when they're writing yeah. these comic books, they want to be the next franchise. And there was a story recently out about Marvel only paying five grand to the uh, creators that have led to this incredible Marvel universe. All of that foundational stuff that the movies took from those comic creators didn't really get paid for. And I think this is just the next evolution of these creators wanting to own the properties that they create, the stories that they create. And so they're yeah. hoping that they get picked up and earn big money because the studio wants to make it their next franchise. That's my opinion. So 29 years after image comics, we got kind of a new image comics. Is that what we're seeing? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, Tinian made a big deal out of the fact that they're going to own the property and not have to, you know, just get paid, um, you know, whatever fee that DC comics wants to pay them for their stories. They're going to own the rights to these, these projects. So, um, and that's the big thing with Substack is that they allow them um, that ownership. Okay. Anybody else got an opinion on this? I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next few months with this. Because where you're talking about uh, is that, yeah, now they've got their hands on the property, but uh, is a potential transfer of medium like Netflix or Hulu, how are they, how are they going to treat the medium once it transfers from digital slash print to uh, film or TV, will they get that same cut of the pie or is Substack going to come in and negotiate for them? So, I mean, it's still very early to see what's going to happen, but I mean, I, I think if these guys are smart and they've got the right attorneys and the right agents and don't try to do it all themselves, they'll probably be fine. You know, it's just going to depend on how that material is going to be 
uh, treated when it crosses over to a different medium. All right, we got a few comments here. Uh, Dirk Hooper, who's not here tonight, in case anybody's wondering, uh, Sean and Dirk are out of the weather. That's why I'm here. Uh, out of the weather, under the weather. That's why Scott Prime's here tonight to make sure we have a show this week. He said it's a subscription service, mostly for writers. A lot of journalists are going there. Um, he also comments, uh, I like reading digital comics. Okay, that's one of the few. Not exclusively, but it's hard to beat being able to download whatever I want and hunt it down instead of hunting it down. Mm -hmm. And then Walt's chiming in. Yep, the king is wearing his crown. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the <laughs> next subject here. Let's go right here. All right. Our next subject is Fantastic Four turns 60 and they're doing an anniversary, what they're calling an anniversary tribute. And I was, I purposely asked, you know, Mike on here because I wanted to hear his opinion on this. I'm going to share a picture with you. I know I've talked with Gary uh, about giant size X-Men, like a tribute to that. And this is where they take the old comic stories and then they have an artist, like they usually get guest artists that are like really good artists of the industries to maybe do one or two pages in that book. And they do it exactly like the original creator intended it to look. So the, they map out the same thing, just do it in their style. You see a cover here. This is done by Steve McNiven. Are you guys, I know I'm a fan of these books. I bought the Captain America number one or what I guess was Captain America number one or Tales of Suspense 100, whatever, of the tribute issue. I bought the giant size X-Men issue. And to be honest, what it showed me in both of those instances, when I was younger and looked at giant size X-Men number one, I didn't appreciate Dave Cockrum's work. When I saw these other artists mimicking his, his layouts, his panels, his storytelling, it, it kind of blew my mind for the second time. So... I just want to hit you guys and tell me what you guys think about this. In this in this issue, they're going to actually be reprinting two comics, Fantastic Four number one and the Fantastic Four annual number three, which I think is when Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Girl get married. Thoughts, fellas? Ladies? I, I kind of like the idea. I, I, I got the Giant Size X-Men tribute. And, you know... It really didn't, well, or the comic store I was going to didn't really promote it a lot. So when I got it, I just thought it was another reprint with another cool cover by someone new. So I picked it up and, and started going through it. And I kind of, I'm going like, well, it looks just kind of like the original one. But then, you know, all these other artists have chimed in to do their renditions of it. I think it's neat. It's a good way to get people who didn't have the original issue, you know, unlike confused old guy. Um, who bought it right off the newsstands back in the Wayback Machine. Uh, it's a neat idea. I, now, whether it's a 6 or $7 idea, you know, this is where, you know, Scott will kind of chime in because it is a lot of money to pony up for a book that's already been published. Um, for me... your color, newer paper... <laughs> For me, I never owned Giant Size X-Men number one or a reprint. I, I had to borrow that from like Gary or Robert. So <laughs> I didn't mind that. But I'm telling you right now, while I like this idea, I'm not going to buy the Fantastic Four because I'm just not a fan of Fantastic Four. So Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a neat idea. And, I, you know, I, I would have been more appreciative if they had found a, like a, an old script from Stan that had never been published or a complete story by Stan and Jack. That would have been cool. I'd have been ponying up, you know, I'd, I'd pay an easy twelve ninety five for a brand new story that has never been published. Right. Not necessarily one that's been published how many countless times in different formats over the past, you know, three or four decades. And I mean, I read the lineup this afternoon on who all is working on it. It's got a great A-list group of artists. Now, if you just click for the artists, yeah, it's worth it. Other than that, Eh, I'm kind of like you, Scott. I'm not real sure of that. Gary, Jen, you have opinions on this? Well, I have um, long thought. I would love to see what modern technology could do to old books. Forget the old, forget bringing in new artists on these. I would love for them to be able to just the new color technology that's available. Just to love to mm -hmm. see these books 
colored um, because if you look back through some of our old books that we've collected, um, you know, it, the technology involved is not anywhere close to where it is now. The colors are not no. any, not anywhere close to as vibrant. Don't jump off the page like they did. So the fact that they're recreating this, um, I'm not interested in Fantastic Four. I, I honestly could not care less about Fantastic Four, but I'll probably look at it. Um, I might pick it up for nostalgia. Um, yeah. My understanding from um, the other books is they managed to take out some of the culturally maybe uh, insensitive <laughs> things that were prevalent. Uh, yeah. That right. People didn't know about. So it'll be interesting to see it's, you know, what changes maybe they made. But to be honest with you, I wouldn't know what changes they made because I didn't read the old Fantastic Four. So um, I'll look at it. I'm not going to buy it for seven bucks. I can tell you that. Um, I know. Yeah. And they I could have picked better stories too. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, yeah, number one, but uh, the the wedding of uh, Reed and Sue. You know, they could have easily done first the first full appearance of Silver Surfer, Annihilus. You know, yeah, one of the one of the really cool Doctor Doom stories. You know, if they uh, wanted, they could have brought in one of the early appearances of Black Panther. You know, if you want to agrees with you, Gary. Uh, Jenny, I mean, comment. I know this is not your thing because it's superheroes and you don't really care. <laughs> I'm kind of like Gary. I don't care anything about Fantastic <laughs> Four. Uh, but, I mean, he did have a good point about seeing some new ways for it to be drawn and colored yeah. and the cultural part. That's a good point. So, all right. It might be kind of interesting for that. All right. We'll wrap this up. We'll go to the next thing. Here we go. All right, I'm bringing this one up just because I know I've been to San Diego Con Comic Con in the 90s with, I think, Mike and John back in the day mm -hmm. and Robert. Yeah. And I know Gary's been there. Uh, I know Jennifer has never been to a comic convention because she's uh, just Jennifer. new to this world of comics and, and reading the floppies and trade paperbacks. I mean, being a cool chick your whole life and not being to a comic con. <laughs> Plus, all the comic cons are coming back. Is this news or do we not even care wizard world which if you don't know but if you're old as me mike and gary there was a magazine called wizard magazine that had all the pop news and everything for the new comics and a price guide that we all thought our comics were going to be worth millions of dollars and we'd buy it all the time and then they went on to conventions and had con exclusive things and big name guests and for 20 plus years they ran com comic cons and stuff and I myself went to the Chicago Wizard World Comic Con and competed in the World, uh, the HeroClix World Championships up there many, many moons ago before my daughter was even born. So is this a big deal that they're going away and they're turning them into Fan Expo? Because from what I've read, it just sounds like this was basically me running the show of a business and I just kind of hand it off and sell it to Gary and he still makes mm -hmm. the same sandwiches I do. Yeah, I mean, they, they just put it under new management. Yeah. Right. I mean, it looked like go ahead. the only difference might be that they're going to have it in a few different cities. So maybe open it up yeah. a little bit to some other places, uh, which yeah, I mean, might took, be good they for took us over in the, Oklahoma. Yeah, they took over the Denver one just this past year from Denver Comic Con. Fan Expo took that over. Uh, that one, you know, because I I'd gone to, to Denver from the inception for the very first show up until about three years ago. And hopefully the Fan Expo group will have a better organized, less dramatic uh, group of people running it because that was the problem with Denver. Denver started out, they were expecting 5,000 people and 26,000 people showed up. And it was a great three-day show. And then it just grew every year. But the problem was the the guys in the mission statement involved with that started seeing things differently. One wanted to, wanted to keep it because it was basically a huge fundraiser for, for reading and getting kids more interested in reading. And, and then the other guys were looking at it more like from the fan expo direction, wanting it to be more of a, a profit building. They were wanting, cause it was at one point becoming the alternative San Diego comic-con 
if any of the major artists couldn't get into San Diego because they were at the same time in the summer, they would go over to Denver instead. So, you know, I got to, got to see some great guests over there uh, on Artist Road. You know, so met Frank Cho the first time. You know, I've Ben Temple Smith. I mean, lots of really good guys. And uh, the first show, you could just walk up to them and just hang out with them. <laughs> right. But then as it grew, it kind of got less and less of a hangout and more of a just get in line. So, um, my pers- my perspective from this is like, it doesn't really matter because I've been to fan expos and they're very nice, well-ran cons. But I think you have to give Wizard World some credit because they... I mean, from what, when I was younger, and this is just what I remember, there was a few big cons with San Diego obviously being the biggest one. And then when all of a sudden these Wizard World cons of like Dallas and Chicago and all these things started popping up, they had the big name guests because they had that big name. And it was a a big deal for a good long time and stuff. And I, I even remember they had the little promo things, which I never knew how they could afford this. But if you went through the Wizard booth itself, uh, for Wizard Magazine, they had this wheel to spin, and they'd ask you like a goofy like trivia question, which was easy, and then they'd let you spin it. And I won like tr- like uh, statues and everything from them. So like, yeah. I was just like, man, they must be hemorrhaging money or something. But for a while, it worked, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and I guess finally, like whoever was in charge got tired of it, and he's <laughs> glad to be done with it. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think Fan Expo. I think they did this because they wanted Chicago. Chicago's the second oldest con in the country behind san diego and it's a it's a big big time show and i think fan expo wanted it and fan expo has had you know uh mike's right i mean they've they've moved a lot towards entertainment i mean if you go we've gone to fan expo dallas i think two or three of the last four years uh-huh. and uh i mean they have a massive autograph section with uh-huh. you know people coming in for you know uh, Sylvester Stallone's going to be here, or, you know, uh, yeah. um, somebody from the original Alien movie is going to be here, and people line up around the corner uh, to get autographs. Me, I'm just over and looking for the dollar bin, trying to find some gem <laughs> in a comic book, you know. Um, but it's, uh, I think what's going away, and you can see this even in a lot of comic shops, what's going away is a lot of the comic aspect of these and more entertainment mm-hmm. games. And I know we're going to talk about games tonight, but um, uh, so I think Fan Expo does a good job there. It's a well-run convention. Um, you know, I think that I don't know how their price compares to, to um, Wizard. Honestly, it's probably pretty comparable. So going to the Dallas show several times, I expect that they're, we're not going to really see yeah. much of a team, although just maybe a more shift to entertainment stuff. Yeah, I mean – I guess that's the part I, I don't like, but San Diego always has had that. You In the early years when we went to San Diego Comic-Con, it was a comic book convention that had yeah. you know, a preview of a movie, a couple of movie stars would show up, and now it's just the opposite. It's, come on, it's really oh, yeah. like a co- comic movie central a- a- entertainment with some comics in the background. And, and I'm very fortunate and lucky that I got to go when I did and really enjoyed it for the comic side of it. Cause it was yeah, epic and, and just, a, and just amazing. And I don't know if I'd care to go now with so many people there and I'm not a big movie buff. I enjoy them, but like, yeah, just movie stars after movie stars. I think it's good that they can go get some old guy who, did his time in Hollywood and we enjoyed him 25 (laughs) years ago and you can set up a booth and you can, you know, send the tickets through him. So he gets, you know, $30 to to sit there and take a picture and stuff. I think that is good, but that's just not a comic convention to me. So it's more of entertainment convention. Yeah. I would like to see them. I'd like, I would love to see them have some gaming tournaments. I'm talking about board games, massive blood bowl tournaments, massive magic tournaments at these cons. I think that would really be, a cool event to kind of do some combos um, in that area. But um, I'm with you. I, I mean, when I, last time I went to San Diego, this will date me big time. When I went to the San Diego comic-con, there was a massive statue of the time machine, that time machine remake that came out in mm-hmm. 1993 or 91. I don't even remember when it was, but um, that's the last time I was at that con. And I think ever since then, it's, I, I, I don't even think I could get into it. It's so. No. Well, and I remember, and again, dating myself, uh, San Diego used to have a huge retailer show before the the con. 
and we would go to that. And that was nice because it was just all retailers and guests. So you, you got to get up and talk. They got to talk about, you know, the new projects they've got planned. And, you know, it's like it's where I met uh, Dave Stevens when Rocketeer was just starting to take off. Right. And they had just got signed to do the film. So, you know, you saw that and they had the big Herkimer battle wagon for mystery men there. And, uh, you know, and you saw, it was, saw just that was just kind of the beginning of where Hollywood was starting to go in and make its footing sound. But I mean, you know, the opportunities to go in and see your favorite artist or guys that don't hang out at the Marvel booth or, or DC or whichever. Uh, and, you know, the, probably the, the best original comic convention that I, I've gone to regularly up until recently was OFCON in Norman. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just a couple of weeks ago, that's right? All, that's, yeah, I didn't, get, I didn't get to that one, unfortunately. Uh, you know, okay. and that's the first one since Bart Bush passed away. So, uh, but I mean, it's just, for those type of shows, it's just pure comics. You go in, you trade, and, you know, they'll have, uh, they'll have what you said, Scott, they'll have some of these old guys who've done comics and uh, for, you know, 30, 40 years, and they're still working. Uh, they had Sid Berry there a few years ago. He's the guy that uh, has done the Phantom comic strips since, mm -hmm. since Lee Falk passed away a long time ago. And, you know, they had a, one of the guys from uh, Dick Tracy, the, the creator of Alley Oop, which I didn't even know was still alive at the time, <laughs> uh, was there. And it was cool because, you know, the drawing's still the same. He's still got that same attitude. Plus, you get to see all these old guys who really, the only reason we collect comics is because of these guys are at this show, Bud Plant. You know, he's, he's like the second or third most authoritative individual on basically all kinds of comics and Bart, you know, a lot of people didn't know this. If it really wasn't for Bart Bush and his little shop down in Norman called down memory lane, uh, we wouldn't have comic shops at all. Cause he was really recognized as one of the first comic book shop owners and was dealing with getting the books direct and not having to go through the old magazine distribution system. So, you know, and, it's interesting to listen to these guys talk about books. The last, last show Bart was at, he had picked up a book. Uh, it was an old Popeye comic from the 1950s that there were only three copies in existence, and he had one of them. Wow. And you just, you just don't even ask. You just sit there and go, like, that is freaking cool. Because if you're, if you're really getting into comics and you're really wanting to, to specialize in comics, those are the guys you want to talk to. Those are the guys that have all the information. They tell you who worked, who worked on it first, who, who stepped in and did a couple of issues. Uh, you know, if it's like old Superman knew the one was the first red kryptonite issue, which was the red kryptonite issue that Superman turned into a giant ant and was commanding all the other giant ants to take over the world, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Ike Wilson, another guy who is, you know, one of the biggest experts on original comic book art. It's also had one of the, he's also got one of the biggest collections. He's got stuff that you would never see in a book, let alone see it right in front of you. The last show he was at, he had one of the alternative Kubert covers from the third Dark Knight series. It, that, he also had the original art for one of the Carmen Infantino flash stories from the 1960s, which was the original art to the first comic book he ever bought which he had framed with the original art. Hmm. And That's these cool. are just guys that, these are just guys that have, they're, they're a wellspring of information that nobody really gets in and talks to about because these guys know the processes. Uh, he used to have an extremely large John Byrne, Terry Austin, X-Men collection of original art because Ike used to own a store. Mike? And Ike invited oh, okay. Byrne to his store all these original pages and sold them for a whopping 35 bucks a page. No negotiations. <laughs> where would you, where would you find that? You can't find an original John Byrne comic book page for less than $10,000 now. Right. Well, and he was getting, he was just buying them in bulk, you know, and he just, he would always come to these shows and he would have some cool new art that he picked up from somebody who's either had heard of 
or you'd never, never heard of from the, the golden age of comics, you know, and it's just, it's amazing. We don't get to, we don't have shows like that in abundance for these guys to get out and pass this information on to the next generation of collectors. So, well, you know, I, I think the other side to these being having a lot of movie stars though, at least from my perspective, going to a few fan expos with Gary is there was a ton of people there maybe to go get a picture oh, with yeah. Chris yeah. Evans and stuff like that. And they paid oh, yeah. the money for that. So they helped fuel that to, to, you know, put a space in artist alley for some of the lesser oh, yeah. forgot or some of the forgotten guys. So therefore yeah. for me and Gary, we laughed at everybody standing in line paying $50 just to see Stan Lee for five seconds. And we enjoyed going yeah. through artist alley, picking up some pictures and some talking to, I mean, we talked to Bernie Wrightson. I mean, at that thing, yeah. Bernie Wrightson yeah, yeah. was there before he died. And, you know, we were like happy to talk to him and there was not a line. So like yeah, if, true. For us, if the movie stars are going to like make some people happy and pave the way to let these other oh, guys yeah. get in on the same gig, I'm all for it. So we'll move on. We, we got that subject taken care of real quick. I just wanted to let everybody know if, you know, over on Facebook, you can go to our Task Force Geek uh, group. You can talk and talk nerdy stuff over there. You might be watching us through uh, Facebook.com slash Dirk Hooper. You might be watching us live right now. There's also the YouTube channel, uh, Task Force Geek YouTube channel. And I know, I think Dirk is still streaming this through his Dirk Hooper Plus account. And of course, you can watch us live on twitch.tv slash Task Force Geek. All right. Let's see if we have any comments and then we're going to move on. Let's see. Walt says, I'm there with you, cons for it all. And he laughs evilly. <laughs> all right. Let's go to our next subject, which I got to check and see what it was. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's kind of hard to do all of this by yourself. So, um, yeah, here we here we go. <laughs> All right, this uh, subject is not really a time machine, but it's kind of a time machine. To be honest, that was like the only banner I could find that would talk about a subject in our past, but it's also present day. Um, if I find the right little banner here, we are going to talk about Doom Imperium board game review. Uh, we'll try to be quick on this because I know nobody wants to hear me break down every little thing about the Dune board game I do. over and over again. <laughs> um, yeah. We got to, we got together a few weeks ago uh, to play Doom Imperium with uh, Dirk. He sat in on us. We all played. Gary was there. Jennifer was there. We played a, a four-player game. I will say this from the very beginning. Dirk, I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but stole my move almost every round and really pissed me off. So he's not here for me to yell at him. Um, Jen, Gary, since you were there, would anybody like to describe what this game is? And the reason I put Time Machine on this is because I'm going to talk about three different games, two that are coming out, and this Dune one. Dune to me, before this board game, was just an old crappy movie that had Sting in it that I never wanted to watch. After playing the board game, I'm ready to see the new movie. Jen, Gary, take it away. Can you go ahead? Uh, okay. <laughs> I have never seen this movie. I have not read the book. Hi, Betty. Um, so I went into this knowing nothing about Dune. Hi, Brandon. I know it's like a planet with a lot of like dust. And the spice <laughs> spice melange, and that's all I know. <laughs> uh, so I did not know if I was going to like this game or not because I know nothing about it. Um, I, I did not think I would like it, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, I ended up loving it. Um, you don't have to know about the movie or book to like it. It's just a really fun board game. So um, I, when when Dirk was not stealing. Scott's moves. I was stealing his moves, so he got mad at me during the game too. Uh. <laughs> yeah, pr pretty much they stole all my moves, which only tells you that like those were probably the best moves at the time, and somebody just beat me to it. Well, I'm gonna show you. You're just the innovator. That's what it is, man. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Uh, here's Doom Imperium. <laughs> this this is the board game. I'm, I got a few pictures here to kind of show. Uh, I got these off a of Board Game Geek. 
Here's a little bit of the layout. You can see some of the artwork has the characters from the movies, the upcoming movie in it. Uh, you see Dave Bautista and Zendaya in there. Um, what's our next one here? And this is kind of the layout, just showing everything with the game itself. Um, I guess what I could say about the game, if you play board games, it is a worker replacement board game and it has deck building into it, which is, I'm sure there's other worker replacement games with deck building, but to my knowledge, I couldn't tell you what game that has that mechanics that I've played yet. Um, Gary thoughts. Um, it's the best, some of the best $50 I've spent um, in a long time. I saw this, I just had saw it on board, uh, board game geek and, and some, a lot of people had said it, how good it was. So it was 50 bucks. So I said, sure. Uh, the thing I love about this game is um, the combination of, the deck building and the worker placement, and you can have conflict with other players in the game. So it's not a Euro game where um, you're basically you're playing against other people, but really it's all individual moves. This is direct conflict with your the people um, that you're playing against. You can ally with people that you're playing with, um, stab people in the back that you're playing with. Um, you can bluff on combat. Um, you can backdoor them on combat. You can... Uh, win by going strictly um, all the political moves and intrigue Oops. in this game, uh, gaining in, um, uh, influence with all the factions of Dune. Uh, and the, the art is beautiful. I mean, they got great artists to do the art on this game, um, built it off of the characters from the film. And I'm, I was stoked about watching the new movie anyway. Um, but this game is... I. It's one of my top 10 games. I love it. I would play it um, weekly, um, you know, if, if people wanted to play it. That's how much fun I have playing it. I, I agree with you on a lot of – actually, most of everything you said. I think it was interesting. I think we played two or three games, and every time we've seen it, Gary, together, me and you played, I think, three games, um, one with our friend Alex and then a group and then our last group with Dirk. Uh, we've seen it win with, you know – not some battles, some politics. We've seen it all politics. And I would say this one came down to just winning a lot of big battles. I mean, wouldn't you in a lot of ways? There was a lot of yeah. being deceptive. There's, and, there's and other parts of the game that have like entry, which they were like wild cards that allow you to um, greatly enhance your battle force. So that's what I'm talking about, bluffing people in. Um, you can bluff them to think that you're not bringing much of a force into a battle and then backdoor them with an entry card where you have troops just swarming them to win battles. And um, that's really what happened this game. I was lucky enough. It's the first time I've won this game, by the way. Maybe uh, I should clarify. Every other time I've taken last. So um, it's the first time I've won. And there was three or four massive battles um, with with Hoop that, that uh, uh, he was really all in on that I was – Jennifer or I were able to kind of backdoor him on with – different cards we had in our hand and that we revealed um, once the battle um, was over. So uh, I've never seen such big armies fall to a bigger <laughs> army until this game. Yeah. Yeah. It, for everybody that loves playing board games that might wa watch this, I would definitely say this is worth the money to invest. And I would say you should, you should do it before October, play it before the movie comes out um, uh, because I think it'll enhance uh, your joy and watch the movie. Uh, for anybody out there who's watching this and, you know, you've seen the pictures of it and you, th you love Dune or something like that, I all I can say is I don't love Dune and I love this game. Gary owns it. I'll probably only play it when Gary is around, but I desperately want to go buy it and just put it on my own shelf to have it. And I know that's kind of stupid since I'll only play it with Gary. Uh, so if you are a Dune fan, I can't imagine how much more you would love this game it feels yeah. like it could be open for expansions as well. If you're a big board game player like me, Gary and Jen, you know that they come out with a board game. They have little expansions. They add cards to it for some just different factions and stuff like that. It feels like it could be expanded upon and added to, but the game is tight. It's just the first one to 10 points, and then you have like four different tiebreakers. And it's uh, it really gets down to like, you start thinking most board games, you don't think about the tiebreakers because it's usually, 
it's a point salad type game where you win 99 to you know 90 points to 70 points. But this one, I remember Jen specifically, she was planning on tying the game, winning the battle, tying the game, and trying to win on tiebreakers. And then I think Gary or somebody played an entry card that threw all that out yeah. the window. But you <laughs> have to you have to play for the tiebreakers. I mean, you really do have to play for the tiebreakers. I was collecting my spies because Gary and I were supposed to be tied. And I was going to win with my tiebreakers. And he yeah. pulled those cards out and slapped them down. And I was like, oh, man. It's fun. Everybody should go play it. And yeah. there's another Dune game coming out. Um, don't be confused. Get Dune Imperium. Um, I, I have nothing... At, I have no knowledge of the other game. I just there's another one coming out that looks extremely similar, and I would definitely recommend picking up Doom Imperium. I think the I think the box size is also similar and stuff. So remember, it, it's Doom. No, I'm sorry, Doom. I keep wanting to call this thing Doom the whole dang time. <laughs> that just shows you how much of a Dune fan I'm not. It's Dune Imperium, yeah. the board game. Um, I wish Dirk was here to kind of talk about it too, because I know he had a. He had a blast yeah. playing it. He did pretty good for his first time. He did great. Yeah. I, I can see it being really expandable, too, because, you know, there's like half a billion books written in that series, you know, by uh, Frank Herbert and, and John Herbert and Brian Herbert. And then I think Kevin J. Anderson even did them, you know. So there's a there's a whole there, – you could really world build based off of all those books because it you know, expands over thousands of years. And, and I think the board game came with what, like eight to ten different characters. Am, am I wrong in that game? Yeah, that seems. Okay. The thing I love about it. Another thing I love about it is one of my pet peeves with games now. Most board games now, big time board games, it takes an hour to even set the stupid game up. I mean, yeah. you have three hundred components. You have twenty different piles. Um, I'm thinking of that uh, Elysium game that I bought that we tried to play about the dreamscape and it. Took like an hour and a half to even set it up. And this <laughs> wow. game, um, this game is so self-contained. Very easy components. Very easy to understand. Um, it's one of my favorite game type, and that's um, easy to catch on, but really hard to be good at. Um, right. Those are my favorite type games. Well, I felt this is personally. I, I felt the first two times I played it, you know, like I learned something every time I played it, and I got better. And then this last game, I just felt like I crapped the bed. So, like, yes, if things don't present themselves to you, I mean, like, a few moves that didn't get blocked here or there, and like I said, I don't know if Dirk was doing it on purpose or not. I, being his first time, I don't think it was on purpose. I think there was a few times it was just circumstance. He was like, I'll just go here. And he, he didn't know what I had in my hand and blocked my only move. So it kind of sucked. Uh, let's see what some people said. Brendan says, I never get mad. Yeah, that's right, Brendan. I never, ever, ever get mad playing games at all. Thank yeah. you, Brendan. For Scott will get mad at his friends and love of his life during board games. <laughs> <laughs> he, will make you think, he will make you think he's going to tip the table at any moment. Come on, Jim. Uh, Jennifer, stick up for me. Jennifer. I mean, he's not wrong. Yeah, no. There's, there's <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure at one point in that game, you got up and left because yeah. you were so mad. And yep. Gary and I looked at each uh -oh. other and we were like, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm 47. I used to play sports. Gary understands this. We don't play sports anymore. So we, we play board games and this is our sport. We try to, we try to be the best. <laughs> I mean, I was... And listen, I'm not one to talk. I really have to work on my competitive balance when I play games because especially if I'm around people that don't know me, they're like, God, this guy is an a-hole. <laughs> I really have to work on that so I don't give off that impression. I have to physically try not to care uh, when I play uh, because Scott's right. We've been competitors our whole lives. And when you lose the ability to compete in one arena, that has to be replaced with another. And we play board games. I mean, we play board games and card games and uh, video games and or board, board games that mimic sports. <laughs> yeah. Board games that mimic sports. So um, this, uh, the aspect of that I really like about this is that that deck building where you can get points to buy cards in the round. You have to manage your hand to manage both combat and points to buy cards, and um, it's that kind of hey, do I want to buy that card that's available? that could really enhance my game or do I want to keep it from an opponent? Um, it's that, yeah. that aspect of the game that I think is really cool too. 
if, if you're out there and you're interested in this game, I highly suggest go watch this video. It's called Watch It Played by Rodney Smith. Jennifer knows who I'm talking about. Gary knows who I'm talking about. Go to YouTube. He'll walk you through it. You can decide if this game's worth it for you. Uh, let's got a few more comments here. Uh, Dirk chimes in. He goes, I think you attribute some of my nefarious game plan to me trying to d- do my best. It wasn't aimed at you at all. I wouldn't even know how to do that. You liar. <laughs> you liar. And then uh, Anthony Radford comes in here. He says, I don't remember Scott getting mad at the tournament last month. <laughs> Disappointed maybe, but not mad. No. I did really good at the Blood Bowl tournament. But, Tony, I was human after that first round. <laughs> Uh, one more from Tony here. He said uh, he still has to learn Nemesis. Yeah, that's a game that we post playing all the time. And he uh-huh. said, "Try and stop trying to get me involved in another game. You will like Dune Imperium, Tony. I promise you that. I mean, me and Jen don't care about Dune. And yet we're telling you it's really good. It's worth having. And someday I'm going to buy it even though Gary has it. Well, it's at your house now. So I'm not going to leave that there. So, it's going to become the new Moisey Salou. Why don't yeah. you tell everybody about that? <laughs> yeah, no, my, my total recall VHS tape that you still have. What I are mean, you talking about? Yeah. And my Moisey Salou rookie card that's worth like 40 cents. You can. Wow. Those were mine, my friend. Yeah. True story. I borrowed Total Recall, I think, after Gary got it for his birthday, and he never, ever, ever, ever got it back. Yeah. I know. We watched it a lot, though. Thank you. Think about it. Yeah. The tracking's all messed up on it, I bet. All right. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> on one scene in particular. Uh-huh. <laughs> Three of them, baby! Nine. Three! Uh-huh. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Gets a little fuzzy in that area. <laughs> yeah. 722 is yeah. the counter. Yep. Like that in your green chair. <laughs> True story. The first time I met Robert Henry, back with when we had VHS tapes, we were watching Conan the Barbarian, and there's boob scenes in that. And I remember when a boob scene came on. Now, I remember my dad talked to us before. Now, you boys take be mature about this. This is PG-13 or whatever. He leaves. We watch this movie. First night, he's staying the night at my house. He grabs a piece of paper and starts writing stuff down. And I go, what are you doing? And he I'm said, nice. I'm writing down the, the counter of where the boob scenes are so we can go back and watch them later. And I was like... This guy should be my friend for life. And I think that's kind of the theme of me and Rob. (laughs) He still does that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm going to cover this real quick. I don't know if you guys read this. I found it interesting. To some, this might be old news. To me, it was brand new news. Uh Uh-oh, we lost Mike. Mike had enough. (laughs) Now we're here. All right. We're just going to keep going until Mike pops back in because there's nothing I can do about this. Um Renegade Con online, August 27th and 28th. And you might go, what is this? And I'll tell you what it is. Um, Me, Gary, and Jen obviously play a lot of board games. And if you recognize Renegade Games or Renegade Game Studios, they made Raiders of the North Sea, which is a favorite of our game, uh, Architects of the West Kingdom, all those games from Shim Phillips that we know and love and I have every expansion of, they, they make those games. Uh, Raiders of Cement, I think it's called Samantha. I can't pronounce it, but it's like the the clone version of Raiders of the North Sea, but it's rethemed with different artwork and different mechanics. Anyways, this is their gaming company, and I noticed this popped up on Facebook, and probably because I tweet about tweet and post about games all the time. So the uh, you know the cookies in my phone said you probably want to watch this, and I noticed that they have GI Joe Transformers and Power Rangers. And the reason I bring this up is, is because this is an online con. I clicked on the link. It talked about the upcoming G.I. Joe and Transformers deck building games. It talked about a Power Rangers, I think, deck building game. But it also talked about doing role playing games. And I guess in the same game system, I got to be honest, I didn't read a whole lot. I just read their agenda. I think it's set in kind of like the Dungeons and Dragons uh, fifth edition rules, the core rules. But this is going to be for like one of the things that you can go sit in online is how to make your own G.I. Joe character for the G.I. Joe role playing game. And this is something when we were kids, Gary, we would have lost our freaking mind over a G.I. Joe role playing game. 
no question. I, I'm l- hey, listen, I, I might want to play it now. I definitely <laughs> play the deck building game. Why not? So, Mike's back with us. Hold on, I'm gonna add Mike to the stream. Yeah. Hi, Mike. We're talking about Hi. this Renegade Con and the new okay. the properties for the GI Joe and the Transformer and Power Rangers role playing games and their deck building games. I got some other pictures here. Uh, we were just talking about the excitement that I would have had 20, 30 years ago for a GI Joe yeah. role playing game. Gary, what would my nickname be? Uh, I don't know. What do you? You got to have a code name, right? You have one planned out. Yeah. Well, well you're. you're... <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I think well, like Roblox's already taken, dude. Uh, you probably do like Python Prime or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, didn't, didn't, just... which didn't we have? We had Sergeant Slaughter since we had wrestlers in GI Joe at the time. Hmm. You, know, you know, we could. Jen could, would be you know, private privates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to these pictures really quick here. This is the, I guess, the concept art for the, the, the box of the G.I. Joe deck building game. All right, I need you to buy that. Oh, God, I need you to buy it so I can try it to see. Um, what I think is interesting, though, they took – so I read the IDW, a real American hero book that Larry Hama still writes to this day, which takes the numbering from the old Marvel G.I. Joe series. Yeah. They've taken one of the artists that works for IDW – and has been doing some of the books lately, and he has the art in the um, the in this game. So I f- find that very interesting. And this Don Morano character, she is actually uh, like a female ninja that has like snake in the comics in the real American hero comics. She has like Snake Eyes's essence or <laughs> his fighting style and all that. All his memories downloaded into her. So she's basically a female oh. Snake Eyes. But I find it interesting that they took all these from the Larry Hama G.I. Joe Real American Hero comics. So I like that a lot. I'm sure we had some comments here. Let's see. How you get his essence? I, you're going to have to go back and read it. It was something with uh, Dr. Mindbender's brainwave machine or something like that. Because he's always trying to mind control the G.I. Joes and it always fails. Uh, Dirk says Dune is awesome. Look forward to playing again. Tony's talking about Twisted Lords Con. Oh, for next year. I see that. 2022. Yeah. In July. You got a year. And then this is the guy who I, the reason I put this topic on here is because I wanted Walt to watch the show and just get crazy. Well, I'm all in yeah. for the G.I. Joe Transformers role playing game. Uh, unfortunately, there's no pictures of the G.I. Joe role playing game. Here's the Transformers deck building game. Ooh, I need you to buy that too. I know, man. <laughs> so they got the needs wall- more deck building games, card games. So, like he needs another so hole Scott, in the head. Scott's not a and, sugar daddy. He's a game oh, look daddy at that. for look it. At jazz. I am a game daddy. Yeah. Jen, please confirm it. My, I need it. I need some confirmation here. You are a game daddy. All right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to show you guys that because I know we all grew up with the G.I. Joe in that incarnation. I know Mike <laughs> loved G.I. Joe before all that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So action man. Be available? Uh, they're taking pre-orders now. Here's the truth of the matter. As a board game guy that has a lot of deck building games, Jen is right. I don't know if I need another deck building game <laughs> at all. Um, Jen doesn't really care. She's okay on deck building games. It's not her favorite genre of board yeah. game. So <laughs> I think I'm going to wait and find out how good these are before I just buy it just because mm. of the property. But what I'm hoping is Renegade Games makes a lot of games like Raiders of the North Sea and other games that the other type of strategy games that we like. I'm hoping this will lead to even more and more G.I. Joe and Transformer board games itself because – we really lack the, those as a property for good board games, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine how hyped we'd be if they were at a G.I. Joe or Transformers board game with awesome miniatures? I mean, come on. Exactly. Oh, yeah. The, the miniatures you could get in a Transformers game, it'd just be insane. That would be awesome. I mean, Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast had a Transformers card collecting game just not too long ago, and I bought a bunch of that crap to play with some buddies, and we hardly played it all. And it had nice art. And buddy group. That's interesting. I, what's that? I wasn't in that buddy group. Well, you didn't get back into board games and comics until the last, ever since you stopped working for the Thunder. You have more time now. That's for sure. Yeah. So you want to play some Transformers? Yes. 
Yeah. All right. All right. You're in, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, see what my next subject is here. And let's see if I can find this goofy banner and let's go to it. All right. I consider this the feature of the show. This is our last main topic for today. We are going to talk about free comic book day. It's Saturday, August 14th. It's coming up right just days from now. Uh, I believe this started. I don't, I meant to look it up how many years ago this was supposed to has started as a kind of a way to promote comics and get people into the stores. I know like the first couple of years, maybe the first since the beginning, they tried to sync it up with a big summer release of like a Spider-Man movie or something big that was coming out. So it's usually happening in May. Um, this year, I mean, last year, even with COVID, it got pushed way back. And this year, I think they're sticking to this time frame once again. Did we even have a free comic book day last year? Does anybody know? I can't remember. I think it got canceled. Yeah, I don't think we did. I All I know is my store finally put the free comic book day stuff out. No, just do it. Do a- Say again? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The shop out in, when I was still out in Odessa, mm-hmm. uh, they got a, a few things, but it actually spread out over like three weeks. Okay, I think that's what my weeks. shop did too. They put a few out every time just to get people to come back in the store. Yeah. All right. My question to y'all. Do you like Free Comic Book Day? That's the first one. Quick answers. Go. Yes. No. Free comics. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gary, I got to ask you why. Uh, it's like tax free weekend. It's the day I do not want to go in a comic book store. Okay, tax- that's fair. Tax free weekend is, yeah. I won't catch me in any retail store anywhere on tax free weekend. And yeah, I, I made that mistake accidentally last week. I mean, free comic book day. Listen, anything that gets people into comic books, I'm all for. It's just not for me. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into a comic book store where there's, you know, parents with their gaggle of children. And I'm a parent, so I mean, nothing against gaggles of children um, yeah. being loud and obnoxious and crowded, and it's not for me. Um, there's good and bad to that because most of these comic stores. Thank you, Walt, for the information. It started in 22, so I mean, look, year 19. That's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a usually comic places have a lot of back issue sales and stuff on this, so it's kind of a big deal yeah. if you're a consumer because you can go in there and get you a statue that you'd never wanted to pay a hundred dollars for, but you can get it for seventy five dollars and stuff like that. Good time to do Christmas shopping if you have children into this stuff. Yeah. Okay, it's, so it's, that, it's good if you have like little niece, nieces and nephews, and you know you want to get them something introduced. You know, ironically your enough, or brothers. My niece this weekend, I talked about going to the comic store, and I told her next weekend is free comic book day, and she got her this look on her face and looked at me, and she's like, "Can I go?" And I was like, "Well, I think Scott and I are probably going. Do you want to go with us?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, I want some comics because mm-hmm. she's just starting to get into some comics and drawing yeah. comics." And uh, I said, okay, I think that we're going to go around. So talk to your dad, my brother. And, uh, and she asked, she even asked him, you know, dad, if Aunt Jen doesn't take me, can, can you take me to get some free comics? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, we'd probably do that. So she's excited to go this weekend and That's get cool. her some little free comics. And she's 11, so she's jazzed about it. And she won't see Gary. <laughs> she will not see Gary there. No chance. All right. So if if you do participate in free comic book day, because I always do too, when you grab the free comics, do you read most of them or even all of them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious yeah. because if, it, if if it's stuff if, I haven't read before, okay, I mean, that's how I got into the Mouse Guard series. Was free comic book day, and it's actually it's a really good series. They just 
uh, just released a new mini series uh, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It looks nice. So, yeah, and it's a it's a good series. Well, I asked that question because usually we hit so many shops. You know, if you go to five mm -hmm. shops and you can get four items at each shop or something, I come home with 20 books. And most of the time, if I'm honest, I only read maybe half the books or just a little over half the books with intentions of always reading the other ones eventually. And, and I read so many comics that I just never get to it. So I, yeah. that's why I was curious if most people go in there picking up and then they never actually read the stuff or, you know, what it is. Um for the people that's participated, have you started reading new comics because of Free Comic Day? Probably. <laughs> well, like I said, mouse card for me. So. Okay. I remember Robert Kurtman years back did the Astounding yeah. Wolfman number one, I think, at Free Comic Book Day. And yeah. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. Josh something did the art. Anyways, I started picking up that book just because I read it at Free Comic Book Day. It was a jump on point and it was pretty awesome. Um, so to me, if, if you're out there and you don't know what free comic book day is, it really is like we say, it's free comic books. But I'm going to say this to you parents that maybe take children or those people who go in there and you just hoard the free comics and walk on out. The comic books do not cost the store any, uh, they're really not free to the comic book stores. The mm -hmm. comics, like a normal DC comic that's four bucks, your comic store pays $2 for, then resells it for four. These comics, they do get them cheaper, but they might be 50 cents a unit, you know, 75 yeah. cents a unit, maybe a quarter a unit. So they're still paying for them. So please remember that when you go in there and take advantage, or I say this a lot because I see a lot of people come out of the woodwork on free comic book day. And some of them, treat the comic stores like we owe that to them. And that upsets me because like we pay for the yeah. comics. So, so just remember that. And Jennifer knows this more than anything. If I take my kids into a place for a free comic book day, I walk out of the store by purchasing at least one item, whether it's yeah. a back issue, a trade paperback, a t-shirt, an action figure. So usually free comic book day costs me a lot of money. <laughs> um, but I don't know about you guys, but I, I think this is a great idea to get the young kids into comics. And mm -hmm. I guess the reason I love comics and Gary knows this very well, cause he grew up with me my entire, pretty much my entire life. Um, I'm, I was really bad at, at the written language of English. I was bad at reading comprehension. Gary would know because he's always proofread my papers, even through college and helped me out. Uh, I think I've come a long way. Like I was out of our friends. I was the math guy and everybody else was the English guys and, and stuff like that. But I was in like remedial reading classes because I just couldn't pass those tests that we took at school that everybody else passed. And I think comics saved my reading life because I finally stopped buying them for art. And I remember GI Joe 51, I finally decided just to read this thing. And it took me, I think, over an hour yeah. to read one little comic. And I kind of liked it. So it got me to read more and more and more. And then luckily, yeah. my, my peers were Robert and Gary, who everybody knows. Gary's here. Robert's been on the show before. And they love comic books. So we encourage each other to read all sorts of stuff. And we probably don't all like the same stuff, but we've read everybody's little bit of genre of stuff. And it kind of expanded for it. So... I am very thankful for comics. And I even remember my father, you know, he, I remember one day he said, I thought you were going to grow out of them. And I said, no, I'm never going to grow out of them. I said, if you didn't like them, why were you, ha why did you let me read them? And he said, I was very happy that you were finally reading something. And he wanted to just encourage that. So I'll always remember that. And I highly encourage it to people who have kids that struggle to read or finding something they like, because there's something out there in the comic format. Now you yeah. Now you've made me feel really bad for this and free comic book day. <laughs> I, so, yes! Uh, I told you that story would work, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah. No, listen, it is it is great for kids. It's just not for me. For tax-free weekend is great. For people that want to go buy stuff for their kids for school. I just – I don't like yeah. to fight crowds. So uh, I'm, it's not for me. Um, but it, it – I understand what it does. I agree with you 100%. If it can bring more people into this industry, reading it, collecting it, wanting that next issue, I am all for it. Um, yeah. Anything keeps the, the and grows the medium, I'm ultimately for. And hopefully it's successful for all the shops. Yeah, I 
got some free comics from Free Comic Book Day when I was a teacher, and I put them in my like classroom library, and kids would go over there and kind of look through them. They didn't really sit down and read them so much um, because I taught special ed, but uh, they did sit and look through them as an yeah. option. So, I mean, maybe that will they'll remember that like, oh, you mm -hmm. know, my teacher had comics, and so maybe I could read them yeah. too. Yeah, so I know I when I my classroom too. So mm -hmm. that's good. I keep I, I kept a handful of graphic novels and stuff. Yep. I know when I tried to when I taught class like art classes at the library on like creating comics or comic characters and stuff like that. I would always get luck. I was always lucky to have Wizards Asylum donate some books, whether they're old mm -hmm. free comic book day issues or just uh, regular titles or old beat up trade paperbacks or something. And I know every time I did a show, the kids would light up because it was like if you're on good behavior, you're going to walk away with some of these comics and stuff. So. I'm all for this. I think, you know, reading is a uh, power, so to speak, because, you know, I, I work with people who don't read well and you can tell the way they communicate through text and stuff like that. And, um, I still, there's a few of them, these young men that I even encourage to sit down and read comics. Cause I get teased all the time for reading comics, but I keep trying. So who knows? I'll probably grab some of these free extra comics and, uh, throw them on the, on the tables at work and just see who maybe opens their minds a little bit. There you go. All right. Anybody else have any comments on free comic book day? They still have that. So you still have that degraded Spider-Man. Cause I think I might come by that. Speaking Which of, one? That graded 9.8 Spider-Man on the shelf. Well, if you talk about it on the show, somebody's going to go steal it from you. So, so expensive. Don't it's go gone, Gary. Don't go <laughs> it's uh, gone. Yeah. I think I might try that. Well, I'm not coming there this weekend. So, well, just it's free comedy day. You're missing out a bunch of sales. I'm telling you, uh, yeah. some of the other local shops are doing stuff. Um, if you're in the Oklahoma city area, I know new world comics, uh, up on Meridian, they do a 24 hour sale. And I think one of the yeah. hours at like two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, like three to 4 AM is like your discount is your age. So we could go up there and get a lot of, I'm telling you, that's oh, the one to go well, look man. at. Yeah. They do a bunch of crazy yeah. little things. Um, so Jennifer better be ready to stay up late and be goofy. <laughs> yes. Half off for sure. <laughs> More than half off for some people. <laughs> yeah, Anyways, it's a great event. I, I, I hope everybody participates and support your comic shops. Um, yeah. Real quick. I want to talk about this. This is, I didn't tell you all about this, but I'm going to kind of promote Maybe the next thing that's done by Task Force Geek, we're about to wrap it up here. But um, I want to add this. If you are one of those people that like to talk about four hours of spoilers for a one-hour show, come <laughs> watch Spoiler Alert with Dirk, Beth, and Walt. They're going to be live tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central Time. I'm hoping, I'm assuming that this is still going on. I didn't even confirm with Dirk because he's the one that's really in bad shape with everything going on. I hope his voice can work enough. If not, I'm sure uh, Beth and Walt will pull the wagon there for him. And uh, anyways, come talk Marvel's what if. Now, the reason I brought this up is uh, I have a theory on why I'm not interested in this show. And if you've seen it, please don't say any spoilers too much. I think the what if comics when I was a kid were really special because we didn't mm -hmm. do a lot of alternate timelines or this magical spell that went all over the earth and turned all these heroes into like having Thor's weapons and stuff like this. But for the past 25 years, and I mean, probably more, we've had these big epic events at Marvel and DC where everybody gets changed. And it feels like to me, like the, the action figure companies mm -hmm. or the gaming companies go, Hey, we need a crossover. Can you do something where everybody gets Venom's, you know, symbiote? Oh, yeah. and they go, sure, no problem. We'll do that. And then they create these little storylines for six issues or like, uh, there was one with like all the mystical weapons. What was that one called? Um, original sin, I believe, or something like that. I, yeah. Anyways, there's these big crossovers where all these things happen. The House of M was one of them. Age of Apocalypse was one of the early ones where like they did all these things where all these changes happened. And then after three months, everything went back. 
is what if a big deal to people like us who've read comics for 30 plus years, Mike, Gary, I go to you because well, you probably read more superhero stuff than Jennifer. Well, when the, when the original what if stuff came out, yeah, I thought it was pretty, it was pretty cool. But you know, after a while they kind of got a little on the silly side. Uh, but you know, you know, the one where Tony Stark creates his own Avengers when the Avengers break up, that was a particularly mm -hmm. good one. But I mean, back then too, they also used all these really cool artists. So you got some great stories. You got some great artists. You got uh, what Frank Miller did, though. What if Electra had not died, which was a pretty good story. Uh, you know, the really cheesy one with uh, what if Spider-Man had become a celebrity and you see him on the cover wearing a brick cape. You might make a point there. Back in the old What If series, they had really good people doing the stories where I felt you know, like the What If series that was like still around in the early 90s or whatever was a bunch of guys who were trying out for Marvel for the first time. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I could be wrong on that, but well, th that's what it felt like to me. You know, that, that was kind of what Marvel fanfare was around that same time as well. So Marvel fanfare was basically, that was like, the first works that you know Mike Golden did for Marvel, uh, Paul Smith. I mean, a lot of those guys, and and Miller too, because there's that really great Miller, Captain America run on Marvel Fanfare. So those those were their inventory stories, which were much better than the DC Talent Showcase versions that came out around the same time. So, but I think I think the Marvel ones. I think the editors kind of gave the the writers a little some in some cases a little too much freedom and it's how we got some of those really really weird ones well i think um with as bad as marvel's timing was with the black widow um and i'm not talking about COVID. i'm just talking about when they originally intended to release it i think their timing on this what if is actually perfect i mean with the events of loki mm -hmm. the loki series and you know blowing up into this multiverse it really uh and i will tell you that i started the well, first episode before the show and i didn't finish it uh, no spoilers here but the art is fantastic i mean yeah absolutely first rate incredible um, is that the agent watch, carter one is that the first one that agent carter yeah yeah okay um, i've just seen i've seen the previews of it i still have uh two weeks before my internet set up in my apartment so yeah, well, the the art in the first, you know, what if Agent Carter became Captain Britain, basically. Um, yeah. it, it's incredible. And um, I think that you can almost watch it and go, well, is this canon? Is this canon for Marvel? Because it is a multiverse. They can easily say, hey, this is shooting off in all these different directions. Sure. And we can okay. do whatever we want. And I think that um, for that reason alone, um, that's the only way we would we're going to be able to see like the zombie episode that's coming out, um, you know, uh, and the um, uh, the Black Panther, and I think it's super cool that uh, yeah, Black Panther becomes Star Lord. And... Yeah, that he becomes Star Lord. I think that it's it's those things that I think are really intriguing. I mean, not you know, not you know, what if Peter Parker ate some bad mushrooms like the right get off on you know. <laughs> And right. uh, so I think that um, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be um, if the art on, across the series is the kind of similar to what's in the first episode, it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. Jen, you have opinion? Cause you didn't read any old what if comics, right? I did not. Okay. I now's the time, Jen. I mean, I could, I have some for you. I could take this show or leave it. Honestly, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't have any dog in this fight. So you'll watch it. You'll like it. I'll probably watch it with Scott yeah. and I'm sure it'll be fantastic. And all right, let's, let me get through some of these comments real quick. Uh, Walt said some stores make free comic book day, a mini con. That's true. I know. Um, yeah. What's the big comic store in Dallas. We like going to the game shop. Madness. Madness always has like uh, Power Rangers. The people do voices and stuff or the Power Ranger actors. They're signing books and stuff. So they're, that's good. Good comment, Walt. I picked up comics that I haven't seen carried at the store. That's a good time to do that, too. Mm -hmm. It's a great time yeah. to tr try new books, that's for sure. Uh, Walt said uh, tomorrow's show is happening. Dirk may not be there. 
Dirk says, Beth is running the show. Look at this. We're all multitasking ah. because Hoop is a wuss. But no, he, he agrees. He, no, feels he feels like poopy. poopy. <laughs> no, he feels poopy. poopy. Steve's saying hi. Hi, Steve. How's hi, it going? Steve. Hey, Steve. <laughs> hi, Mom. And that's some lady. Oh, that's your mom. Hi, hi Debbie. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> And then Walt has a comment. Remember the what if Spider-Man became the Punisher? I do not. Yeah. Interesting. The one, my, one of my favorites, and it was one of the later years, was the ones with uh, what if Silver Surfer had the Infinity Gauntlet? That was one of my favorite. What if yeah. Wolverine uh, joined S.H.I.E.L.D.? And I believe I loved it at the time because it had Rob Liefeld art because yeah. back in the day. So, all right. Well, no. I guess that's going to wrap that up unless somebody else has another comment. Tune in tomorrow if you want to hear and see all the spoilers. You better watch the show first because they're going to talk about everything in super detail. I'm telling you that right now. No, so, right. That's terrible. I, I do have – let me just add some some here on what if. So these are some old what if issues, okay? What if Professor X became Juggernaut? I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I remember that. Uh, Punisher, what if – what if the Punisher was a hall monitor? I mean, seriously? Is that a real thing? Is that the is that the is that the assistant editor's month issue? Uh, it says, yeah, I think it's a real thing. I'm looking through the Yeah, they, they did one. Yeah. The assistant editor's month they had what if uh what if Power Man were a woman and oh shoot, not Was that, that the one with what but if it, Aunt May got the powers of the Silver Surfer or like no, the power no, no, cosmic? No, that that now that may, may have been a different years. Okay. When, so this one had, you know, what if, what if Tony Stark had had an eating problem versus a drinking problem? So you see, you see <laughs> hey, a very, I, that's me, a very obese, a very obese Iron Man with the, the rivets popping off of his armor. Jeez. So a couple of those were really good. A couple of them were just, they were just the dumbest jokes with those assistant editor month issues. Gigi says all the respective panel this evening are wonderful folks. I respect you all. We Ooh, respect you too, Gigi. Yay. And Thanks we didn't have to buy our dinner either. There you go, Scott. What if Thanos joined the Avengers? That that sounds like something yeah. you want to read. Uh, yeah, sure does. Let's see, we got a few more comments here. What if Ant-Man became the Herald of Galactus? Yeah. Another, uh, Ant-Man got the power cause and became the Golden Oldie. That was during a Citizens Editor's Month for sure. Yes. All right. We got one more little segment here, and then we're going to let you guys have the rest of your night. Let me see if I can find my little fun little video thingy bopper. Uh -oh. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now. All right. This is the bag of holding. I don't know if this is the right place for it, but this is basically what we've consumed, <laughs> watched, or read or you bought like an action figure or whatever. I asked everybody to bring one thing to the table and show it off if they would like. Let's start with Gary Brown. Well, I didn't see that note to bring it. So You don't have to bring it. You can talk about it. Okay, I'm sorry. So I uh, I will tell you a couple of things I've read. Um, I just finished 7 to Eternity, um, issue 17. It's the final issue uh, mm -hmm. of the book. Um, that is some of the most incredible art and story that I've ever read. Yeah. Uh, issue 17 is a big bummer. I'm, it's it's depressing. It is probably the most depressing comic book I've ever read. But, Spoiler alert. But it's great, though. I mean, read it. It's great. Depressing because it ends? No, Well, that's depressing, too, but the way it ends, it is... Um, I mean, it's not a very hopeful book. Let's just put it that way. Now you got me curious. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's it's a it's, good series. Just, it is yeah. an incredible series. I might uh, have to borrow it from you. Opania, Opania is amazing. Um, just did they uh, same creative team through all the issues, Gary? Yeah. Okay. I think there may have been one issue that was drawn by a different artist. Actually, I think I think Ryan Sook did one of them. I think so, and I don't know why, yeah. but um, the rest of the books were all the same. And this book is yeah. a little bit, a little bit oversized. Um, I bought as many covers as I could get on it just because I've loved this series so much. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's sad. It's a sad book. And then I just finished um, a nice house in the lake issue three. I've mentioned earlier, which is a really good book. People should definitely get that. Um, and one thing I've been pressing on task force geek online 
is people need to pick up um, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. If you have not uh, picked yeah. that up, um, it's uh, written by Tom King and art by uh, Bill Chris Evely, um, I think is her name. And it is the most beautifully drawn um, creative book I've read in a long time. And I never thought I'd be promoting a book that had Crypto the dog in it. But um, it's actually it's actually really, really good. So uh, I would highly suggest people, when they go to Free Comic Book Day, go over to the shelf and pick up um, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. Isn't Supergirl, to, to you, a different style of Tom King that we've seen before? Oh, yeah, 100%. I think, um, you know, Tom King is very versatile. He's an incredibly versatile writer. Um, but this, the whole feeling of this series feels different for him um, to me. Um, the second issue, um, third issue comes out next week. The second issue takes place, the entire episode, issue takes place on a space bus, just traveling through space. And you think, well, that sounds really exciting. But um, it, the way it's written... Um, the way the character development in this book is incredible. And, um, you know, it had me hooked from like the first three pages of the first issue when Supergirl was depressed and she wanted to go to a planet with a red sun so she could get drunk. I mean, that's not something that's very typical in a Supergirl comic. No. Or any comic related to the Super family, Superman, Supergirl, Superboy, whatever. Uh, I read Son of, Crip, uh, Son of Superman the other day by um, Taylor and I'm not going to, I would not recommend that book, but you know, mm. you might like super son of Superman fighting climate change. And, <laughs> not mean, me. Mean landlords. <laughs> That's not what I want to watch a superhero do. So, uh, we got a comment here from Tony real quick, going back to the games. He says, you mentioned a GI Joe role-playing game. The folks at Eagle Beagle games coming out with a variation called freedom squadron. All right. That's nice to know. I know there's also a deck building game out there. That's, basically gi joe that already exists uh, our buddy jake langham has it and hopefully one day we'll get to play that all right for our next bag of what are we calling this i can't remember what we called this section bag of, uh, whatever holding. Call bag of holding whatever it is we're gonna go to gin prime okay uh i picked up a comic last week i have not read it yet but it's called the me you love in the dark i don't really know anything about it, but I'm excited to read it because it reminds me of Shadecraft, which uh, I finished issue five last week, and it unfortunately is going on hiatus. So to get my Shadecraft feel, uh, to fill that void, I'm going to read this and see how it goes. Um, I just read it. It's really good. You'll like it. Good. That is yeah. what I was hoping to hear. Yeah. You, two, you two stay apart. Mike, I have a problem. My One of my best friends and my best girl, they kind yeah. of read a lot of the same books. We do. I will tell you, any yeah, uh, so. any like artist or writer that struggles with uh, writer's block should read that comic. It's yeah. uh, it kind of deals with that. And it's, uh, it's really well drawn and um, it's quick. It's a quick read. Jen, you could probably finish it in – less than 10 minutes, but it's a, it's a good book. And I will definitely be picking up the second issue. I'll have to check that out. All right. Just so I don't want to end the show and talk last, I'm going to go next. <laughs> All right. I got a, this book in, I believe this was a Kickstarter. Our buddy Doug Wood, who's been on the show several times. He did the, um, the manga, the American manga book. I can't, the name is, I can't remember right now, but he also did this Ultramax. And this looks pretty amazing. I was really happy to get it in the mail. It really, <clears throat> why it is an independent book, it has that feel that this could be an image comic or a dark horse comic. So that tells you the quality of it. I look forward to reading this. This, like I said, just came in a few days ago. Uh, I will tell this, uh, if we're going to be given a, like a really nitpicky review, the book is kind of just slightly damaged on top. And that's just a message to Doug and all the other independent creators who ship books out. Cause I know some of the people are like crazy nuts about like, you know, print quality or I mean like if there's any flaws with the book now, this doesn't bug me at all, but I have a few customers at the shop that it would blow their mind and they'd have to get a new issue. So I hope maybe mine was the only one that came in just slightly damaged. Um, I got a, couple of books here that I want to show real quick. I meant to show these during free comic book day, but I'll just hold them up really quick. 
Here's some of the samples of things you can get this weekend at Wizards Asylum or other comic book shops around the area. So there's kids books, there's adult books, there's superheroes. This one's the the Bailey Kids Vampires Don't Wear Polka Dots. I want to read that. <laughs> we got Sonic the Hedgehog for Sonic the Hedgehog still around all these years. Another one for the youngsters, maybe the Star Wars High Republic. This is the book. This is the Adventures Star Wars High Republic Adventures uh, IDW book. <clears throat> now we're going to get into some more maybe mature readers. I don't know. Ooh. Gloomhaven for you people who play board games and you play the board Gloomhaven board game. You might like this. This is a new comic that just came out. Um, I don't know if this is the debut of this, but I know it's an issue. So there you go. Uh, Red Room by Ed Pixter. This looks really freaky and weird and like so freaky and weird that I don't really want to even read it. This looks like something our buddy Robert Henry would pick up, to be honest. So if you're into weird stuff, I mean, Dirk probably would like this too. So um, another book, Don't Let Your Kids Pick This Up by Accident Parents. This book looks like, you know, All Dogs Go to Heaven mm -hmm. or something. This is Stray Dogs. I don't know if it's a reprint of number one, but the concept of Stray Dogs is, is these dogs are telling the story from their perspective and they're owned, I guess, by a serial killer or a murderer. So they have a story to tell. I have not read it, so I don't know if these are the leftover dogs of the people he's murdered or what. I think so. But, I'm interested. I but it has this crazy art to it that looks like it's just like something out of an animation. Like a Disney book. Yeah. yeah. I heard it's great. I missed out on getting like the first printings of stuff, so... I'll probably just wait someday. Jen will probably get it eventually. So. Probably. Um, if you're a DC fan, we got Suicide King Squad. Shark. King Shark Special Edition. We have a, looks like it's written by Tinian, a Batman Special Edition book. I don't know if it's reprint or new stuff. On to Marvel stuff. Marvel Mighty Avengers. Jason Aaron. That's good people. I don't know if this is leading into the big Dark Ages books or not, but same people. Spider-Man Venom. And what I was told is going to be the biggest thing that flies off the shelf at Free Comic Book Day. Because of Tinian's book, uh, Something is Killing the Children, is, I guess, the debut of his new book, or it's from, I don't know, same world or hmm. something? Oh, it says it right there. From the world of Something is Killing the Children, Enter the House of Slaughter. James Tinian and some artist, I can't pronounce his name, but it's probably really good. Anyways. This is the one that everybody, when I was going through the, the boxes of comics, they were all saying like, oh God, you got to get that. You got to read that. I can't believe yeah. you're not reading Something's Killing the Children. I want that too. Um, hey, is there any way you can get me that? No, you have to go out to Free Comic Book Day or Tax Free Weekend, as you know. Uh, there's the hook. Right Just there. grab me that one. <laughs> I think you're going to have to go find it, my friend. I think you deserve the torture. And Gloomhaven, those two. Just grab those for me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got you, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> you should go with us, Gary. <laughs> uh, Walt said he got his copy of Ultra Max in as well, so that's good. Good stuff. I look forward to reading that. It's on the to be read pile. Um, with that said, I think I don't. We need, don't need to really promote anything individually here. I'm going to let Mike do that because I know he has yeah. a con coming up. I'll say really quick that um, I do. if you want to read more about me or see anything more about me, I think I even have a banner somewhere in here if I can find it. Where it's, anyways, go to bothdown.com. I'm not even going to put up the banner. I do a Blood Bowl podcast there. It's 120 episodes or more. Uh, you can just find me over at bothdown.com. Mike, you have, you have a convention coming up. Is that correct? I do. I do. Yeah. Labor Day weekend. I'm going to be in uh, Texarkana, Arkansas. Uh, Arco Tex Comic Con. This is, I think, their seventh. You know, of course, they took a two year break, uh, one for COVID. And the guy that organizes the convention uh, took a year off for personal reasons. And so they're coming back pretty strong. So I'm going to I'm going to weather the 11 hour each way drive uh, to go do the show. Uh the uh, Peggy Chambers, who's been on the show, uh, she and I worked on a project for Oki Comics called Stone of Thor. So I'm going to be having copies of that there. I actually ordered a sketchbook, a sketch cover for the convention. So that way, if anybody wants a sketch, that's the way to it. If you've seen my Facebook page, I've been posting up a lot of 
different sketch covers that were all. Mike is going to have 100 sketch covers up for sale. It's going to be pretty, surprisingly enough, it's going to be pretty close. Yeah, you may not be too far off on that. You're busting it out. They look good, my friend. I I am. I am. Well, you know, the fall semester college hasn't started yet. So I'm taking advantage of my time. Well, awesome. All right. So you get out to Texarkana. What's it called again? Texarkana Con? It's called Arkla Tex Comic Con. Because, you know, Arkansas, Texas. Texas. Right on the border of Texas and, and Arkansas. Okay. All right. It'll Labor be a Day weekend. Show. Yep. I think Mark Morales from DC Comics is going to be there this year also. Um, and I don't remember who. He usually has a couple of different voice actors there. Uh, the last one I was at uh, was set up with Mike Golden and the guy that does Optimus Prime. Oh, we all nice. Sat, Peter Cullen. Sat, hang oh, yeah. Funny guy. Very, very funny guy. Awesome. Well, gang, I know we were kind of the, the legion of substitute geeks tonight. I do appreciate you guys coming on at last notice because we all got this kind of like, oh, no, Dirk and Sean can't be here. I, I just want to say thank you, Jen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Mike, for coming on today, joining me and my crazy topics that I picked out. It was fun to talk with you guys. I appreciate everybody who's tuned in tonight, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please leave us a, a like and a comment. Share this wherever you can. Tell the world about us. And um, I guess that's all I have to say. So for Jennifer, for Gary, for Mike, I am Scott Prime. And as Dirk says, dream hard. <laughs>